is there concern for Noah Syndergaard, Chris Taylor working his way back, and lots of news and notes from the spring. So that's what's on tap. So make sure to keep it locked on Dodgers. You are locked on Dodgers. Your daily Los Angeles Dodgers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Yo, 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 Dodger fans. Welcome to Locked On Dodgers. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, the number one local sports daily podcast network. Locked On, your team every day. I want to thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen of the day every day. And make sure to check us out wherever you find podcasts and on YouTube simply by searching for Locked On Dodgers. If you want to make it easy, subscribe in each of those places and you'll never miss a day because you know we're not going to. If this is your first time listening watching, I'm Vince Samperio and I... During the season, I'll usually be joined by co-host Jeff Snyder. I know off season has been a little different. But Jeff and I are both lifelong Dodger fans that currently cover the team. I've been to Dodger Stadium plenty of times in our life and have uh, you know spent some time in the clubhouse and locker room, but also sitting in the in the seats. So we're here to bring the smart fans perspective on our boys in blue every weekday morning for around 30 minutes. And uh, that's what I'm here to do today. The Dodgers played in the Freeway Series exhibition last night. They lost. Uh, the Dodgers offense had a bunch of solo home runs, uh, but it wasn't enough to overcome the five runs that Noah Syndergaard gave up which is where we're going to start conversation here with Noah Syndergaard. We'll also talk a little bit about Chris Taylor and just some other news and notes from the spring ahead of opening day. So let's start with Noah Syndergaard. Noah Syndergaard, the the comments he made after the game, uh, we'll get into, just want to get into the actual game. He gave up five runs, nine hits, in going into the sixth inning uh, that bumped his – his spring ERA to 579. Now, I mean, if you watch the show, you know that we talk about spring results and them not mattering as much. But with a guy like Cindergard, it's a matter of we were hoping the velocity was going to come back. And it hasn't necessarily came back. He's touched 95 at least a couple of times in the spring. Uh, but for the most part, he's been consistently, you know, 92, 93, maybe some 94. And it hasn't necessarily – or it, it wasn't an issue for him last year. He was still a pretty good pitcher. He wasn't an ace. You know, he wasn't even maybe a number two, number three, but he was a solid, you know, back end of the rotation guy. And that's what the Dodgers need him for. They have guys that are theoretically – or they have guys that are for sure better than him and should be better than him. Julio being the one, Kershaw being up there, Dustin May stuff-wise is better than him at this point. Uh, you know, he'll settle in in number four in, in terms of that. And then you got Pepio and then Pepio at number five until Gonson comes back. So it, it's not like the Dodgers are, are holding out hope for Noah Syndergaard. Uh, it was one of those where, you know, they believed in they believed in him. He believed in the Dodgers. And it's interesting because when he came to the Dodgers, he signed the deal what he said was, quote, I see no excuse as to why I can't get back to 100 miles per hour and even farther than that, end quote. Spring training, uh, like I mentioned, he's been averaging around 93. He's touched 95 a couple of times. He has not pitched extremely well, especially his last two outings. He's uh, struggled a lot. And, you know, this one he was able to get through the five innings into the sixth. Last one he wasn't able to get through it he had to come out of one of the innings and come back in it just didn't work out and now no center guards tune changed a little bit he said if i don't throw 100 miles an hour again that's fine i'm not going to go out there trying to throw 100 i'm just trying to get out it's not all that important to me if i can just trust my delivery which i did for the most part i think i'll be in a pretty good position now it's not a complete about face it's not like he said i'm gonna throw 100 and i need to throw 100 to be successful he said i see no excuse as to why i can't get to it now he's saying if i don't throw it it's fine i'm not trying to throw it which is you know fine and like i said he doesn't need to throw 100 to be successful he was a successful enough major league pitcher last year without throwing 100 he has a pretty solid five pitch mix um, you know, considering he was a power pitcher and when he was younger, for him to have that five pitch mix is, is pretty good for him. Um, and more, 
it's more relevant now than it was when he used to throw 100. When he used to throw 100, he really only needed, you know, that fastball and the hammer curveball, and he would be good. Now he's got that fastball, sinking fastball, slider, changeup curve. He's able to mix it up, move it around. And that's really what he's going to have to use if he wants to be successful this year. And I think his biggest issue the last couple of times, and maybe this is something him talking about trusting his delivery, which he said he did for the most part, is locating those pitches. You can throw, you can have 10 different pitches, but if you can't locate them well, then, you know, you're not going to be successful. And with him, a lot of the pitches that got hit yesterday were right down the middle. And and a fastball 100 miles an hour right down the middle, you can get with, you can get away with a little more. I mean, you saw it in the first inning. Mike Trout had a home run, 94 down the middle. We saw Mike Trout face Shohei Otani. And then the World Baseball Classic, Otani was pumping 100 pretty much down the middle, and Trout didn't catch up to it. So, not that Trout couldn't catch up to it, but, it, that, you know, that's just a difference in, in velocity and what it does. You have a bigger room for, you know, bigger margin for error when you can throw 100 when you throw 94, 95. And if you're throwing 94, 95 and you're going to throw a fastball, it shouldn't be right down the middle um, because guys can hit that very easily and usually hit that pretty far, and that's what Mike Trout did. And a lot of center guards, you know, things were like that were seemingly mistakes. You know, I don't think anyone – you know, I don't think Will Smith is calling fastball down the middle from Syndergaard when he's throwing 94. So I would imagine their mistakes. And, you know, having to sequence and mix things up and everything else, it, it's a different mentality. And it's one that he did pretty well on the fly last year. We'll continue after this year in order to be a good pitcher and, and kind of evolve into that next step of his career if the velocity is never going to come back. And I think Dave, Dave Roberts touched on this as well. And he said, I think the velocity is going to continue to tick up, which it has from last year to this spring. But I do think that right now, mixing, sequencing, having command, which he does have, is the best course of action. I'm not sitting here trying to chase velocity. And, you know, it's funny that they both had the caveat of, if I can just trust my delivery, which I did for the most part, having command, which he does have, you know, if he had it fully, if, you know, if Syndergaard trusted his delivery fully, if he had his command fully, you don't add in those caveats, you know, which he does have. But, um, and I am i don't think I'm concerned. I'm not concerned for a few reasons. One, it, there's not a lot of pitches that come to the Dodgers and get worse. And for him, what he did last year, 394 ERA, is perfect for a number four or five starter. And perfect for the Dodgers to be able to to you know have success. He, he's that's good. So for him to improve on that, I would hope that the Dodgers and you know Mark Pryor and everybody else in their in their situation would be able to improve on that. Two, if it doesn't work out, Gavin Stellan's waiting in the wings. You know, obviously Michael Grove might be the next guy, the next man up. But Gavin Stone's waiting in the wings to kind of take over a spot. And, and you know, while it would suck if, if that's because Syndergaard is not good or the Dodgers let him go or if he gets hurt, whatever the case is, it is still would be exciting to see Gavin Stone get that action and see what he can do in the majors and see if he, he's going to be a legit guy and or at least, you know, show flashes of, of being really good in the major league. So those are two reasons I'm not concerned. Third reason is it's spring, uh, obviously – you know, coming to a new team and maybe they're trying to make you work on some different things or different sequencing or, or, you know, whatever the case is. I don't think any of that means throw 94 down the middle, but again, it might be a matter of he's trying to get throw fastballs in different counts and, you know, he just missing spots and, and that's going to happen. But once you get into the regular season, your time for experiments, not really there. You got to go after it and just go with what's working best that day. And if you have five pitches, realistically, only two of them are going to be working really well on any given night. Maybe three. If you ever get a night with four or five, then that's when, you know, nights become special. But I think for Syndergaard, I believe in him. I think it's more – I don't know if I believe him, you know, because I like Noah Syndergaard and I've liked him, been a fan of him for a while, or if I actually truly believe in him. You know, we'll, we'll see where that faith goes after his first bad start. But I believe he'll be solid enough for what the Dodgers need in barring injury. Um you know, he'll be what they need. And at, at some point, if the Dodgers do cut bait, there's guys waiting in the wings ready to go. So that's all the Syndergaard talk I have. Going to get into some Chris Taylor talk and kind of, you know, what's been said about his role and 
how that's going to evolve probably as the season goes through. First, let's talk about LinkedIn Jobs because today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. It would have been a lot easier for me to, back in the days of, over my career to have LinkedIn Jobs to find somebody, whether it's for an internship, whether it's for a job, whether it's for you know a coworker, whatever the case was. It would have been a lot easier just to create a free job post, put on LinkedIn jobs, get that, get that purple hashtag hiring frame and add it and let the, you know, the word spread on its own. But I didn't have it now, but I didn't have back then. I do have it now. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. And LinkedIn Jobs helps you find qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash MLB. That's linkedin.com slash MLB to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right. Get ready for baseball season with Locked On MLB's ultimate six-episode season preview. Our local and national experts give in-depth analysis of every team and division in a way only Locked On can provide. Find all six episodes of Locked On of Locked On MLB on YouTube or wherever you get podcasts. All right, so Chris Taylor has now homered the last two nights since coming back from Arizona. Um, but they talked about Chris Taylor's role and kind of what it was going to be. And it, it heading into the season, Chris Taylor is going to be in somewhat of a platoon role in terms of he's going to play a lot of nights against left-handed pitching. We're not so sure how many of those nights against he's going to play against right-handed pitching. And obviously he's going to get time at second base. He's going to get time at shortstop. He's going to get time at third base. going to get time in center. going to get time at left. So realistically, there's chances for him to get a lot of at-bats, and it's probably not going to be just against left-handed pitching. But for the time being, you know, that's kind of where it seems. And, and Robert said so himself. He said that he sees Taylor getting at-bats against left-handers this season. Um, that was kind of after they, he was asked about Taylor uh, and in the spring, you know, in the Taylor in the spring before heading over here. Taylor was hitting 125, had 23 strikeouts and 40 at, 48 at-bats, wasn't necessarily showing much improvement over what he did last year. Uh, but Robert did say, I've been more encouraged the last couple of days, to be honest. Taylor was really searching out of whack. I think he's found a little something, still a work in progress. The last couple of days for me, he's had better intent. I think he's seen the ball much better, swinging shorter. And, you know, with the way the Dodgers are built this year, a little bit differently, they're, like I said, they're still the constants in the lineup. They're still Mookie Betts. They're still Freddie Freeman. They're still Will Smith. And then you got like the next tier, JD Martinez, Max Muncy, who should be good, but you know, they also did struggle a little bit last year, so you're not entirely sure. Uh, Miguel Rojas has looked good this spring. You're just hoping for pretty much average offense from him because he brings above average defense, but regardless. Then you got Miguel Vargas, who you don't necessarily know exactly what you're gonna get out of him, but you have high expectations. And then you got a lot of guys that you're kind of hoping one of them emerges. Um, you know, James Outman, who's looked the best during spring, but you're not entirely sure what you're going to get from him in the majors yet. Um, but he's seemingly secured uh, playing time against right-handed pitching a lot of the time in center field. Then you got Trace Thompson, and you got Chris Taylor, and you got Jason Hayward. And to a certain extent, you got Peralta, who you don't necessarily know what you're going to get. You are hoping that they are going to do the role, you know, going to be good in the roles that they're given. Hayward likely against right-handed pitching. Peralta likely against right-handed pitching. Thompson likely against left-handed pitching. Now Chris Taylor likely against left-handed pitching. But it's not guaranteed, and, and the Dodgers are putting a lot of faith into it, and they need one of those guys to emerge to have a really good season. And I think Chris Taylor is that guy that, you should be counting on one. He's making the most money Two, He's been the guy that that's been probably the best. Well, not probably the best of those four him and Peralta maybe, but the best of those four, the last few years. 
and he's a guy that you're counting on. Um, and for Taylor, it's a matter of when you have a swing like his and when you have a swing that you've kind of rebuilt and, and built up. We've seen him be streaky before, but streaky is means you're good and bad. We haven't really seen too much good over the last well, last half of the season last year so far this spring last couple of nights he's hit a couple of home runs off left-handed pitchers which is which is good to see he kind of said that he's basically what he said was he's kind of he tried to let go of all the mechanics and just kind of swing the bat basically and you know that works sometimes you just gotta let it go and swing the bat and and he did do that uh, and we'll see what happens if that continues because we know with Taylor, once he gets hot, he gets hot for a while. And if you can start the season hunt, then you buy yourself more time. You can get yourself into more situations where you're playing a lot more often. And, you know, Jeff talked about not really trusting Trace Thompson the other night. I've kind of had similar thoughts about it, but it's a thing of if Taylor can secure a more defined role, that pushes Hayward and Trace Thompson to more bench slash defensive roles, which is where they fit. Not that necessarily the Dodgers, they don't really have any defensive liabilities in the outfield. Outman's should be good. Peralta is good. Mookie's really good and right. And then you got Hayward and Thompson who are also good, but you know, there's not like, you're not going to be subbing anyone in late in the game uh, for defensive purposes, realistically. But Taylor, you know, he talked about, how he wants to get back into it playing regularly. And he says, it's a long season. I'm not thinking about the whole year. I'm just trying to get myself right. If I play the way I'm capable of, I'll play against lefties and righties. And yeah, that makes sense. I think that's, I think the ideal situation for the Dodgers is Chris Taylor is good. Chris Taylor is playing 80 plus percent of the time. And Trace Thompson and Jason Hayward are, valuable bench contributors. Peralta's playing left field with when Taylor's not playing left field. And then Taylor's kind of filling in second, short, third, wherever they need him to get guys days off. And you're seeing Taylor in the lineup, you know, at least four times a week. I think that's what the Dodgers want. Obviously that's what we want because that means he's being successful at the plate. And yeah, I, I think he can do it. Obviously, you know, we're, we're going to, Air on optimism over here. I locked on Dodgers for the most part. I don't think, you know, it's a matter of he just all of a sudden is going to strike out 40, 50% of the time just because I think that with injury and any little thing, any little pebble that drops in the in the water causes a ripple effect. And, and that's what happens with guys like Taylor and his swing is, okay, one little injury – that the ripple effect, now your swing's a little bit off. And now, you know, something else happens, now your swing's a little bit off. And now you're not hitting the ball and you're frustrated, so now your swing's a little bit off anymore. Now you're trying to overcompensate by doing too much, and, you know, a lot of things happen, a lot of ripples happen. I think if the waters calm down, Chris Taylor will be good, Chris Taylor will be fine. And honestly, the Dodgers need him in order to really have the success they want this season and to, you know, I don't think, we'll get into this a little bit about, like, the division. I still think the division is the Dodgers to win, but like I mentioned before, the margin for error is less. You know, you don't have, you know, Trey Turner is a, a big part of the lineup that won't be there. So, and you're counting on guys that haven't necessarily been counted on before in the majors or haven't been counted on in a while to contribute. And, you know, you're hoping for Miguel Rojas to find some offensive, you know, strength and, you're hoping for a lot. You're hoping for Dustin May to be fully recovered and ready to go from Tommy John. You're hoping for Ryan Pepio and Tony Gonsolin, you know, to give you quality innings. You're hoping for Noah Syndergaard to give you quality innings. You're hoping for Kershaw's back to hold up for at least, you know, 2025 20, starts. Uh, you're hoping for a lot. And and they don't have that margin for error. And Chris Taylor is one of those first steps that could get you feeling more comfortable about the Dodgers in 2023. So that's it on Chris Taylor couple other news and notes and some talks about some power rankings as they come out before the season. That's what's on tap, so make sure to keep it locked on Dodgers. Built Bar. Today's episode brought to you by Built Bar, and 
It's March. The built March Madness bracket is here, and we know you have a favorite bar or puff, and now's your time to make it count. Go to builtmarchmadness.com to vote for your favorites. You know, I'll be voting for the churro puff. That one's my favorite. And if you want the Dodgers to win, then you'll be voting for that bar too. Support your team, support your bar, support your puff. And when you vote for your favorite bar or puff, you'll be entered into a drawing where 50 lucky locked on listeners will get a free box of built. Not only that, but one locked on fan will win a 12 month subscription to built to have built's best bars or puffs delivered monthly straight to your door. I don't know. There's not a lot of prizes for something free, you know, a free entry. There's not very much prizes that are as good as that. Go get you some built bars, best tasting protein bar covered in chocolate. They got a bunch of great flavors. You don't have to wait to see if you won. You can go buy some of them. If you win, you have even more. So go to built.com, go to builtmarchmadness.com, vote for your puffs, go buy some built bars and vote for your favorite bar. Puff, pick up a box while you're there. You can vote every day in March. So you got a couple days left. So hop in and support your pick. Okay, let's finish up with just some other news and notes from around the Dodgers. Um, One thing is is Tony Gonson. We got a little bit of an update. He's going to be out at least a month. And realistically, that's kind of what we expected um, just based on everything that's been saying. He threw a bullpen session on Monday uh, around 20, 25 pitches. So he's still a ways away, but they're talking end of April for Tony Gonson. So Ryan Pepe has a runway of about three, four starts to really make an impression. And obviously we'd love to have a conversation of Ryan Pepe looks good. Everyone else in the rotation looks good. Tony Gonson's coming back. What are they going to do? We'd love to have that discussion here in the next couple months. Daniel Hudson. Finally pitched and didn't have the extreme injury or the extreme pain or, or discomfort, whatever it was, to be able to pitch again on another, like, the next day. Uh, so he seemingly going to come back end of April as well. That's going to be a boost to the bullpen. You know, we got guys like Phil Bickford in the bullpen right now who, again, if Phil Bickford's your, like, last reliever, you're not doing too bad. But still – Daniel Hudson, a lot better than that, and getting him back into that. You want to get him there because you kind of want to see what his role is going to be, and if he is a guy that's going to be a little bit slower or maybe can't go back-to-back days as often, you know, he might slot into more of a closer role. You know, for a while there last year, Craig Kimbrough was in a closer role, and the Dodgers had to actively find innings for him because they were usually up by big enough or they'd be losing or, you know, they didn't have too many close wins, so that might be a matter of what happens with Daniel Hudson. So we'll see what happens there. But um, that's it on that end. Um, just kind of updating there. Andrew Friedman talked a little bit about this year's team and, and kind of building out for the future. He He's on the record saying last year that the you know next five years look better than what the previous five was. He was right in the sense of the regular season and winning 111 games last year was one of the part was year one of those five years. Um, losing the first round of, in the playoffs wasn't necessarily better than that. But I think this year it's kind of how he alluded or, or kind of mentioned how it's close to similar to 2019 team where Will Smith, Dustin May, Tony Gonsolin, you know, other young guys kind of stepped in and had roles and, you know, became – major league baseball players and that allowed the Dodgers to feel comfortable in trading some other guys for Mookie Betts in the offseason and giving Mookie Betts, you know, that long contract because they knew they had these young guys coming up around him. And he kind of added that. He said, we structured our roster in a way to give some of our talented young players who had reached a point where we felt like they were ready to help us an opportunity, but we don't feel like it's in a way where we're overly reliant on them. And, you know, that's kind of what we've talked about a lot over the, over the, you know, we've called it the youth movement. But realistically, Miguel Vargas is the only one that's, <laughs> realistically, Miguel Vargas is the only one that's giving an everyday role that hasn't had success or, or some kind of sustained success in the majors. Gavin Lux was kind of part of that, but Gavin Lux has had success and has been an everyday player in the major leagues already. 
Ryan Pepio is getting that chance in the rotation, but really he's not wouldn't have got that chance if Tony Gonsolin didn't get hurt. Um, and James Outman now, you know, you're going to give him a bulk of opportunities out there in center field to start the season. So you're kind of counting on two guys, two guys that have been in the majors before, um, but two guys, like I said, that can really decide on how the Dodgers are going to move forward. You know, Miguel Vargas becomes a guy, or if James Outman becomes a guy, then that just knocks off one checkbox that the Dodgers don't need, you know, the next year. Okay, we don't need a second baseman, or we don't need to get a shortstop and move Gavin Lux back to second, or we don't need a center fielder because we have one. You know, there's a lot of different things that that can change because of those guys having success. Um, and that's kind of where, where they're at now. But like I mentioned, the risk is there because, okay, so now if – Outman's not good, and the other guys aren't good, then you have a hole in center field again, which you had last year, but you know, not something you want. If Miguel Vargas doesn't quite figure it out or, or you know goes into big slumps throughout the year, you know, now you got a hole in two spots in your lineup. And if Miguel Rojas is just an averagely, you know, average offensively or below average, then now you got three spots in your lineup that are below average. And you don't necessarily have anybody to bring up or call up. There's no shortstop waiting in the wings. And in terms of outfielders, there's guys the Dodgers could call up if Hayward, Thompson, Outman don't work out, but not any guys that, you know, seem major league ready or, or, or even on the verge of being major league ready. So you're hoping on that. You're hoping on health, which is something you bank on every year, but the Dodgers are, you know, a little bit different this year because you're counting on guys. The depth is there. If, you know, three starting pitchers get hurt and you have Pepio, Gavin Stone, and Michael Grove take over, you can probably tread water and hold your own. But you're also – now your faith in, in in health is now faith in younger pitchers, which can go, you know, obviously a couple different ways depending on how those pitchers react and how they, how they are. So I think with this Dodger team, you need more to go right than normal. But you're still a pretty good team, and, you know, there's still no race shoes with that. And speaking of that, I mean, there's been a lot of power rankings come out the last few days, especially with the opening day coming up. And I think pretty consistently I've seen the Dodgers top five in most power rankings, whether it's MLB.com has them number four. I believe they're number four or five and so much, you know. They've been pretty consistently top five, at least, you know, definitely top 10 if anyone has them lower than that. What we are seeing is the Padres ahead of them in a lot of those. And, you know, rightfully so in terms of offense, they do have, you know, that top four is hard to compete with. And that top four, in theory, could bring you, you know, one run every time through the lineup. And if they bat, you know, three, four times in a game, that's four runs just from your top four hitters, potentially. Um, and then the rest of their, you know, the rest of their lineup isn't as good, obviously, as those top four, but it's still, you know, Jake Cronenworth is an all-star, can still hold his own, and, you know, they have different guys that can that are still good. Their starting pitching is questionable in the sense of they don't have the depth, and, you know, you Darvish is a little bit of Jekyll and Hyde some days. Joe Musgrove starting the year on the injured list, uh, but shouldn't have, you know, shouldn't be a lingering issue. You got Blake Snell, who's good sometimes, mostly against the Dodgers, but hasn't necessarily been that great against everybody else. And then you're counting on Nick Martinez and the other guy that is going to be uh, Seth Lugo, who's going to be trying to be a starting pitcher after being relieved for a while. So their bullpen's pretty solid. Starting rotation, not so much. Top of the lineup is good. Bottom of the lineup. Is you know can go either way, so it'll be interesting to see. You know, it, at the end of the day, it doesn't power rankings. I don't care. It doesn't matter. I'm not offended by the Dodgers. You could rank the Dodgers 30th for all I care, um, because at the end of the day, it's going to be a matter of how they play and, and how they finish in the standing in the regular season, not by somebody ranking them. So, yeah, uh, Dodgers. Despite everything uh, you might have felt as a Dodger fan this off season. The people that are paid to, and this is a little bit of a caveat, but the people that are paid or vote to rank teams still have the Dodgers as a top team in the major league. So we should be happy and proud about that. Um, in the sense that if I don't care where you rank them 30th, I don't care if you rank them 5th, 
it's a similar proposition, but subconsciously we all feel better if your team is ranked top five rather than bottom five, realistically. So that's going to do it for today's episode. Thank you all for listening. Thanks for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen of the day every day. Make sure to check out Locked On Fantasy Baseball. Fantasy drafts are probably coming up these last two days. Listen to Matt and Dom. They got the best strategies for you. Get Locked On Fantasy Baseball wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. They're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We're also part of the Locked On Podcast Network. You can find us where you find podcasts and on YouTube if you search for Locked On Dodgers. You can find Jeff on Twitter at Snydog. You can find me on Twitter at Vince Amperio. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Locked On Dodgers as well. I don't remember if I said that now or if I said wherever you find podcasts and on YouTube. But either way, Locked On Dodgers, you can find us pretty much anywhere. Um, that's going to do it for today's episode. I lost my train of thought, but we're going to end it out with, um, we're bringing the smart fans perspective on our blues and blue. And remember, you don't have to agree. You just have to listen. Have a good one.